Good evening, everyone. Welcome to um, tonight's um, event. This is an online launch session for the latest issue 3.2 for the Interactive Entertainment Law Review. And the topic or the, the spotlight today is on value creation, user participation, participation in video games uh, from the perspective of international tax law. Um, we put together this event not only to celebrate the new issue, but also the diversity of uh, the authors and their background, uh, which is also demonstrated by uh, the perspective, uh, their expertise, which is unique. Uh, the uh, event today as such um, is, is an example of this um, specific um, diversity and uh, uh, specialization of the of the issue because video games and taxes uh, is such a rare overlap that uh, not many people um, have knowledge or understanding of the implications uh, of these two seemingly uh, completely different and unrelated areas. Uh, and so we are extremely fortunate to welcome possibly the only expert out there uh, here tonight. Um, so first of all, we have Anna Vedenskaya, who is the author of um, one of the articles in the latest issue, Common Features of Video Games and Social Networks, Importance for International Taxation. Anna currently works as a teaching assistant in advanced master's program in international tax law, which is organized by University of Amsterdam and IBFD in Amsterdam. She also works as a researcher for the research project designing the tax system for a cashless platform-based and technology-driven society at University of Amsterdam. Before joining academia, she worked as a tax specialist for eight years in a variety of multinational um, companies. The next speaker um, today, uh, or panelist joining us today is Tamara Sokolczyk, who is head of business and legal practice at Wargaming. Uh, this means that she deals with all legal and business matters that the company uh, faces in its daily operation, which of course includes uh, taxation an inevitable fact of life. And we are also joined by Dr. Bernard Schneider, who is a senior lecturer in international tax law at CCLS. He is the academic director of the Institute of Tax Law and director of uh, the LLM in tax law. He teaches and researches primarily in the areas of international and comparative US and Chinese taxation, um, and taxation in emerging and developing countries. His particular focus is on tax policy and administration and the taxation of uh, individuals. So as you can see, we have a perfect synergy of expertise, knowledge, and different backgrounds, uh, both academic, uh, those of uh, practitioners from these different areas. Those of you who haven't met me, um, I'm also based at Queen Mary, uh, namely at CCLS and also at EECS, the School of Electronic Engineering and Computer Science. And today I'm here in my capacity as one of the editors for the Interactive Entertainment Law Review. Given the slightly rare and unique topic, uh, we will follow a different format tonight, uh, which means that Anna will start with a short presentation where she will outline the tax principles and try to explain uh, the complexity and the difficulty um, that um, international global businesses are facing in the digital environment. And then we will uh, discuss how uh, this links to video games um, and affects um, their uh, business dealings. So Anna, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for introduction, Michaela, and I will now uh, share my slides. So, um, as Michaela 
already mentioned, I will give you a brief overview of my paper on common features of video games and social networks and importance for the international taxation. Um, the agenda for my uh, short presentation, which although it has seven points, shall not take more than 10 minutes, is meet and greet. And then I will talk about different questions such as what is international taxation about, digitalization problems and in international taxation, updates of 2021, and then the effect and uh, specifics of the video games industry and the main take takeaways before we can uh, go and proceed with the panel discussion. So uh, first is the meet and greet. And uh, as Michaela uh, mentioned a couple of days ago, the purpose of our meeting today is an enjoyable chat. So first of all, I would like to um, ask you guys, how are you doing? And I prepared a small poll for this purpose. Um, I will launch it now. So can you please? Um, press the Zoom button and uh, let us know how are you guys doing. Well, I see some activity. That's very nice of you. Well, I will I will uh, probably share the results now. And it is uh, very nice to know that uh, people are either super great or great. And we have uh, four students who are writing their graduation paper and it will get better guys shortly. And the other question I prepared for you, and this will affect a little bit my presentation. Uh, so what is your background? We have as an options today, the, our menu, legal, business, tax, video game supporter. I'm a friend of a speaker and some other as well. So uh, thanks a lot, and we see the majority is legal. Uh, some people also not that not that few from tax and business, and uh, five more people who are here uh, to support others and they admire video games as as it is. So I will proceed now with my slides, and we can go further. So um, I will give, uh, first of all, uh, a brief overview uh, what is international taxation about. And um, the international taxation, uh, the, first of all, the, the taxation within one country works when the services are created and sold in one country. So the profit is taxable there only. For example, I prefer always used to um to use the examples i love so this is the um, one of my favorite old video games uh, map so i will use it for the purposes of exercise for example if the uh if the if the services are created in the location of the daggerwood island of might and magic 8 game and they're sold there this is uh, the only country where the taxation arises uh, on the other hand if we see that the the services created in two different countries and they're sold in two different countries. This is where the international taxation uh, starts addressing the issues on where and how much to tax. The main guiding principle of international tax law supposedly is taxing where the value is created. And with all the different legislation of different countries and domestic uh, complexity of domestic law, double taxation and non-taxation issues arises here and there all the time. We will come back to it shortly. Also, important thing to know is there are two main types of tax. Consumption taxes carried out by consumers of the goods and services and profits taxes that usually corporates and individuals uh, pay from their income or profits. For the purposes of our exercise today, consumption taxes are marked with triangles and profit taxes are marked with squares. So what we were seeing before the digitalization starts that a uh, system of international tax law and domestic tax law was working relatively well. So we had a double taxation um, somehow avoided or at least mitigated when the consumption taxes was matching consumption taxes, triangles were matching triangles and squares were working only with, with squares. Uh, what happens in a recent decade or maybe two with the digitalization of worldwide economy? We see that still the key principle is taxing where the value is created. However, the international tax community poses uh, multiple questions such as where the value is created, who creates this value, and is the value created outside of the company? 
what the international tax community come up with is that, that the value is created worldwide. It is uh, created by companies and by users with their data, with their participation, and with their input as well. And digitalized companies carve data from users, monetize it, and sell services remotely. And it is very important uh, that users create value for the company. Uh, what are the issues? So the issues that, 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 that the value which is created by the users is not captured by the international tax law system. And the other thing is that the system dates to 1920s and it mostly cannot capture the income without physical presence. So we know that lots of uh, lots of digital services are sold online and remotely and lots of digital companies and huge giant companies, they do not have any operations uh, in the companies where this, in the countries where they, where, where they sell their services. So this is what um, in current in existing international tax law system cannot grasp. When in my example with the Maiden Magic uh, 8 uh, game, we see that the, although the services can be created on the Raven Shore and the Dagger Wound Island, it is, uh, the service is sold outside of these two jurisdictions in the worldwide. And although the users creates value for, from the different locations uh, and the taxing where the value is created uh, is the guiding principle in accordance to which the, it should be taxed in the market jurisdictions. Well, it is not currently taxed. These are the main problems. And uh, what are the possible solutions? First one is that the countries nowadays come up with the uh, unilateral measures to additionally tax digitalized companies. They come up with the digital services taxes usually as a percentage of a gross uh, turnover. This uh, additional taxes were implemented by the UK, Austria, Turkey, Spain, Italy, Poland, and many other jurisdictions and other jurisdictions also discuss if it should be already implemented in the other countries as well. The other thing that these digital services taxes, they're like very different. They don't fit in the existing system. So uh, when I showed you the triangles and squares, so digital services taxes, they are none of those. They have features of both. And although they trying to fit into the system, they don't, and they cause double taxation and sometimes triple taxation for the taxpayer. So supposedly also they are discriminatory for the digital businesses. What is the other option is that, um, how to address this issue that uh, nowadays around 137 countries tries to come up with the joint solution and try to find an additional tax measure that may be adopted. And this tax, uh, in accordance to the so-called unified approach, uh, will allegedly fit the system. So it will fit in the squares and it will somehow help us to avoid international um, double taxation or non-taxation. So the, there are the cons of this approach as well that is extremely complex has additional administrative burden on the business and it is extremely difficult to find a consensus uh, of countries when it's like 100 uh, more than 100 jurisdictions involved in such an, an sensitive topic as taxation how is the video games uh, affected well first of all video games industry is a textbook example of the digitalized industry productions and sales are made worldwide and for the industry user data is very important and the tax authorities nowadays are fully aware that the, during the COVID-19 times uh, crisis, the industry is blooming. Uh, what are the specifics of the industry, uh, to my mind, which are important for the international tax law? First of all, that the industry uh, was some, for some time off the radar, uh, of the tax radar for a long period. Now it's not the case anymore. Also, the industry itself, it includes different digitalized businesses, such as services provision, sometimes sales of goods and the platform services, broadcasting and many more. And it does not fit perfectly to any of the value creation models addressed by the OECD. Uh, final slide, among the final slides are that, to my mind, and it, I was indicated in, to my paper that we should be very much aware of the differences between single player and multiplayer video games. So uh, single player video games is the game environment with the input of one player and uh, the user is interested in the software only. Well, for the multiplayer video games, the users interact simultaneously 
and users are interested in both software and interaction with the other players. So this simultaneous interaction is essential for this business and each affects all the game design, revenue models, business operations, and all other stuff. Uh, revenue models are completely different for single player video games, multiplayer video games, with their very huge specifics about the in-game purchase and also with the advertisement sales. And multiplayer video games, uh, to my mind, are much more similar to social networks and they should be treated, if not equally, but at least similarly. They rely heavily on user participation and network effects and this reliance is reflected in the business models value creation process, revenue obtained, and it should be also important for the respective international tax law obligations. So my final remarks for this brief presentation is that the international tax system is messed up and no one has a perfect solution for it. With the COVID-19 time crisis, uh, governments worldwide aim to tax more and digitalized companies are the target number one. Businesses with the outcome of any outcome, pillar one, DST, anything else, they will have lots of work and not only costs for finance related or tax related departments, but also for back end developers, uh, system architects, big data specialists and others. And of course, as usual, most probably this is the gamers who will have to cover all this cost and just pay more for the video games they're playing. So it will affect uh, regular users. Uh, with you and I. So um, thank you very much. It was a brief, uh, a brief overview of my paper, and I would like to proceed uh, to the discussion. Thank you very much, Anna. I think this was an impossible uh, feat to summarize the complexity of international tax law system under, the, <laughs> under 10 minutes, I think. Uh, um, this is uh, completely extraordinary, uh, but it exactly demonstrates uh, the, the main points that uh, you highlighted towards the end. And that is not only the complexity of the system, uh, but the fact that it is finding it very difficult to catch up with the changing business models and with changing uh, environments and adapting to um, digital, digitalization of, uh, of the economy and the changing nature of user participation and uh, value creation. Now, my first question uh, is going to be uh, to uh, Bernard based uh, on your very brief presentation. And I just wanted to ask if uh, some of the OECD experts were here today with us, which I kind of hope they are somewhere uh, amongst the participants, what would be the first uh, thing or the kind of advice uh, you would um, give them in terms of trying to get a better awareness of uh, the digital economy and the different kinds of digital economy that exists? And, um, as we looked at video games, they're quite um, unique in the sense that they don't fit in any of the uh, models that the OECD proposal is, is putting forward. Very tricky question. It, it, uh, it is indeed, uh, and potentially a politically loaded one. So I, uh, contrary to what you just said, uh, part of me hopes that there is no one from the OECD. <laughs> Um, it, it's, it's a complicated uh, uh, situation, as Anna has uh, so uh, uh, outlined so well. Um, but to be fair, it's complicated because the underlying reality is complicated. Um, and I would say two things uh, uh, immediately in, in terms of uh, your question. One is that clearly there has been an evolution in understanding on the part of the OECD. If you sort of go through the painful process, uh, which uh, I'm sure Anna has done and I have done to, to at least to some extent of looking, you know, starting with the first action plan in 2015, all the way to where we are now in 2020, when uh, a lot of things about the uh, uh, digital economy or digitalized or digitalizing uh, economy were not really clearly addressed. Um, I suspect both as a function of lack of knowledge and lack of time. 
to the most recent frameworks that came out at the end of last year, which talk very explicitly, for example, about online gaming um, and other areas. Uh, so clearly there has been uh, uh, a change uh, for the better in terms of there, and to be frank, my and I suspect almost everyone's understanding of these issues. Um, and to, so that's one thing I would say. I mean, I'm, I'm sure from the specific perspective of online gaming, uh, it, it feels understandably that the level of knowledge is not as deep as it could be, or the level of you know familiarity is not as strong as it could be. But it's certainly much better than it was five years ago, um, and it's been you know very much a learning process for everyone. The other thing I would say is that we are we are having the the, the luxury in, in this discussion of a, a very good article and presentation about the taxation of online gaming, um, uh, and 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 you know a, a long overdue one uh, you know to focus on it. Not that there's been nothing written before up till now, but not much. Um, but from the perspective of not just the OECD, but anyone who's trying to think about the taxation of the digital economy more broadly, the online gaming uh, sector, so to speak, uh, or the sector, single player, multiple player, and so on, uh, is really only one part of the digital economy. Admittedly, a, a, an important uh, and a growing one, especially because everyone's either, uh, you know, apparently everyone's either on Netflix or on games. And, uh, and, and someone from Netflix said that actually they're more afraid of, uh, you know, uh, online game uh, platforms than HBO, which I found very revealing. Um, but so from the context though of the digital economy, it's not just about online games. And a solution has to be found or various solutions have to be found that can deal reasonably well with the digital space more broadly without singling out. I mean, they talk about not ring fencing the digital economy. Well, you certainly then don't want to ring fence pieces of the digital economy either. Thanks, Bernard. Um, taking the kind of same question and, and flipping it uh, around, um, Tamara, from the perspective of uh, representing a video game company. How would you describe is uh, the process of value creation and user participation different when we talk about video games uh, and other types of, of digital economy? Where do you think that uh, video game industry sort of has its unique, uh, unique characteristics? Because it's not just in uh, sharing data. Uh, video games are very uh, specific in terms of the kind of engagement, uh, the immersive and interactive nature. Um, so if you were to, again, provide a little bit of explanation and, and guidance, and as uh, Anna explained in the, in the initial presentation, there's a big difference between single player games and multiplayer games. Uh, where do you see the main distinguishing feature? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michaela, and good evening, everyone. Uh, glad to see many people uh, here listening to us uh, this late hours, uh, speaking about very fascinating topics such as taxes. Uh, and uh, Michaela, thank you. The question is uh, very relevant, um, and it's relevant not only for uh, video games industry as a standalone industry within the digital economy, but it's also relevant because there are uh, multiple different models that uh, video game companies pursue uh, when they uh, basically make their profits. And each of those models, uh, in my view, can impact uh, the taxation regime in the end of the day. And just to give you an idea of how complex the whole industry is, um, uh, again, my opinion that uh, uh, I think Anna also shares because she mentioned uh, the division between um, multiplayer video games and single player video games in her article, uh, but this is just um, uh, the top of the iceberg. Because if we think about it, we see that uh, there are not only um, single player versus multiplayer video games. Uh, there are video games that are, uh, for example, based on different monetization models. And uh, from that, you can also derive uh, to a different taxation. So for example, the game can be monetized through the subscription, through the sales of in-game items, through the sales of the data of the users, 
um, and through any other creative ways uh, which the developer arrives at, you know. So it's very difficult uh, to come up with a single and universal solutions for those cases. On top of that, uh, there are different publishing models which also impact the taxation. Uh, so uh, here we can uh, broadly divide them into, I think, two types. Uh, one is uh, one being the self-publishing when uh, the game developer is uh, publishing the game on its own. And the other one uh, being the publishing through the digital platforms, in which case uh, the taxpayer uh, for the um, indirect taxes, for example, such as VAT or sales tax, is usually the platform and not the game developer. While in the first case, it's uh, usually the game publisher who is paying both uh, direct and indirect taxes. So you see that the complexity of this question, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not only uh, due to the fact that the video games um, are somewhat different from other digital economies, but it's also because in between themselves, video games are very different. Um, and uh, as I said, I'm not sure there is a universal solution for everyone uh, in our industry. Thanks, Tamara. Um, just picking up on that, I wonder, um, and this is a question for Anna, uh, whether the OECD and uh, other institutions, including um, EU, uh, will be able to differentiate between the different types of companies, obviously from the really large uh, big tech companies that uh, may be dominating the sector, but perhaps do not represent uh, the majority of the companies in the space, which may be medium or, or, or small size enterprises. Um, from your reading and understanding of the proposal, do you think that uh, the positions that are being put forward understand this, uh, this distinction and will enable um, other than large tech companies to, to thrive in, in a sector uh, given uh, the proposed uh, approaches? Or is, is perhaps the approach uh, of OECD very much focused on the large tech companies? What's your, what's your opinion there? Well, thanks so much, Mikaela. Um, as far as I understand the uh, OECD proposal, it only focuses on the huge multinational companies which operates worldwide. Um, and it only also, it not only affects digitalized companies, it also affects, um, it also affects consumer facing businesses. But what do we see now that there is no solution and there is no agreement between 137 countries, which is like a huge amount. So, and this is only the OECD uh, proposal, which we expect to be updated uh, mid-March or early April after the G20 meeting. Uh, so uh, the, the huge updates are expected in the first half of a year. And the other thing that recently, I think maybe a couple of weeks ago, um, EU confirmed their uh, initiative. If the, no conclusion and no consensus is reached, they are launching the digital levy which will only affect digitalized companies that will not affect uh, consumer facing and other businesses. And they are in their proposal discussing also an option of taxing middle businesses, not only the huge multinationals. What is also interesting that UN, like Net Net United Nations came up with their own proposal of taxing uh, automated digital services and they do not speak about uh, threshold whatsoever. So it is a little bit uncertain now, but for sure all these uh, multi all these in international organizations, they make a differentiation between the size of the businesses and between the nature of the businesses as well. But again, this issue of analyzing as Tamara uh, mentioned, it is extremely complex to analyze just one business and they're trying to find a solution to analyze and to come up with taxation of all the businesses which I think is an extremely complex and very ambitious task. So, well, let's see. And hopefully maybe in a year from now, we will be able to have a very nice conversation about how's it going and how the perfect solution is found and the consensus is reached. Well, I hope so too. And um, this complexity, as you said, and also the, the lack of unified um, 
harmonized approach uh, has clearly a detrimental effect to, to legal certainty. Bernard, what do you think would be the best solution going forward? I know, um, as we've already established and, and mentioned a couple of times, it is an incredibly difficult task. But uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, what would be the best path to achieving at least some level of harmonization on the international tax uh, level that would uh, support uh, or strengthen legal certainty of companies, especially uh, medium and small sized ones? If only I knew the answer to that <laughs> excellent question. Um, I think that unfortunately we are going to be looking at uh, uh, considerable uncertainty for some time to come, uh, which is to say, you know, for at least probably another 10 years, considering that this, this sorts of issues have been brooded around for uh, roughly a decade. Um, and that's both because no one's quite sure what to do. Um, most of the proposals out there, including the, the OECD pillar, pillar one in particular, are facing opposition, as are digital service taxes and, and other things. Perhaps we can talk about that uh, a bit more later if you want. Um, um, but also because, and, and here I am completely unqualified, but my understanding, Tamara uh, and Anna can speak more to this, I'm sure, the, the, the underlying reality and the distribution, uh, uh, you know, the economic effect uh, or weight of, of various aspects of the digital economy keeps changing. Um, so um, certainty would be nice, but considering that, as Anna said, we're trying to and failing to fit a 1920s brick and mortar uh, system into, you know, into the current or the, I should say, developing uh, a reality, um, this is not likely to settle soon, I'm afraid. As you mentioned, the, the changing uh, reality, um, Tamara, what is your experience of uh, the shift from games as products to games as services and the impact it has on, um, on taxation from a, um, your professional perspective, your day-to-day -day business uh, dealings? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michaela. Uh, a very interesting question indeed, and um, I think I can uh, share it with you one industry insight uh, that actually it's a good example that shows how different uh, uh, game models or uh, monetization models within the games in the end of the day influence the taxation uh, of, the, of the games. Um, so um, I, I cannot say, first of all, I cannot say that there is a common shift in the industry from standalone games to um, uh, massively multiplayer online games. I think uh, it's still the case and the matter of choice uh, of the game developers, uh, but there is a somewhat drastical difference uh, in between those two, uh, not only in terms of technology, the underlying technology that um, uh, stands behind those, uh, but also uh, in terms of operation of those games, uh, and particularly uh, in terms of taxation. Uh, so to give you an idea of um, a very interesting case that was happening uh, for a few years in Russia, um, there was always, uh, there was a continuous debate, so to say, uh, how to treat uh, the games, uh, massively, massively multiplayer online games, uh, where the user purchases the in-game items and not the game itself. Uh, so how to treat those purchases from the standpoint of the law. Uh, and then based on that, how to tax those in-game sales. So it's pretty clear that uh, the sales of the standalone game under Russian law is the sale of license. Uh, and uh, in, uh, under the Russian uh, tax code, the sales of license were exempt from VAT. So most of the game companies obviously used this uh, you know, opportunity to exempt their sales from Russian VAT. Uh, well, that's uh, not, I wouldn't say avoiding paying VAT, but uh, using their rights to withdraw from this payment, so to say. Um, however, uh, at some point, a few years ago, Russian uh, courts arrived to 
a slightly different uh, conclusion in respect to the games uh, where the in-game items are offered for sale. And by analyzing the uh, monetization model and also the technical background of the games, uh, Russian courts arrived to the conclusion that what is being sold to the user is not a license, but rather is a service. And the license is provided to the user for free. So within the game as a service model, the license is again is provided for free and uh, the service is sold to the user. And the service as such uh, is subject to Russian VAT, obviously, if this is a Russian user purchasing this service. So this reality, uh, it existed, uh, well, until, until very recently. Uh, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the game publishers managed to prove that um, even though they are using this kind of game as a service model, they're still selling the license. So different uh, players in the market uh, well, were using different exemptions, but uh, nevertheless, most of the players uh, somehow treated their game sales as the license and exempted them from VAT. So Russian authorities seeing all of that uh, decided to change the tax code. And as of the 1st of January of this year, uh, they have uh, changed this rule that uh, the sales of the license are exempt from VAT. And they said that the sales of only license to the uh, something that is called Russian software are exempt from the CT, uh, thus making this exemption uh, effectively inapplicable to the for the foreign uh, companies. So this is just one example of how, in the end of the day, uh, the model uh, that uh, the game developer or game publisher uses can impact severely the taxation, because we are speaking about, here we are speaking about 20% uh, of VAT, which is a significant leakage for the company, if you think about it. Um, so I don't know, Michaela, if this answers your question, but um, I, I can elaborate, but I don't think uh, I need to do it. Uh, no, that's... That, that absolutely uh, uh, is a spot on. And, and I wonder, Anna, if you think that the proposed um, principles, the proposed solutions, um, capture or take into consideration the, the rapid change, not just in the underlying technology, but also in, in the business models. And uh, this obviously is true, not just for the video game industry, but for the digital economy as such that we are moving away from selling physical copies to selling digital copies to actually not selling products as such, but providing services that are then being made available uh, from the cloud and so forth. So the distance between the end user and the actual product is um, growing and it then takes a completely different nature. It's not a product anymore, but uh, becomes a service. Do you think that this is captured uh, in the proposals that the drafters are uh, are aware of the significance uh, of these changes? Well, thanks so much, and thanks so much, Tamara, for for your overview. Um, well, I believe so. Answering your question, Mikaela, but the thing is that in my uh, in my slides, I was showing. Do you remember like triangles and squares? So uh, the issue that is addressed by the OECD and UN and others is the squares. And the issue which uh, Tamara was talking about is triangles. And it all is taxation and there's different types of tax. Uh, and well, we see now that the main issue that, 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 that OECD is trying to address with their proposals is exactly the shift to services and sales of services. But to my mind, uh, this, of course, due to the complexity, sometimes something slips away, especially the fact that the services are different and especially the fact that different uh, business models and different businesses, they require different user participation and they have different uh, business models and value creation models. So the OECD is absolutely aware of these differences and these documents are like each document issued every couple of years is 250 pages or 300 pages. And in 2020, we had two documents of 250 pages each. And of course they are aware of these differences. Hopefully 
these differences will be underlined and will be uh, will be included in the proposal. But the fact we see that that it is so complex, such such a, such a huge issue that. Well, hopefully, hopefully they will manage to include this all in one proposal. But, um, well, I'm trying not to be skeptical here. But well, again, let's see. But uh, yes, answering your question, they are absolutely aware of these differences and uh, about this all this tax stuff and the VAT and then and and profit taxes. And well, they're working. They're working hard. There's there's no doubt in that. Super, thank you. We've had one question so far, which is directed to Anna, but I would like to ask all our um, panelists today, and that's about uh, what do you think about the future of the Pillar 2 and the digital service tax? Um, do, you, do you expect it will, it will succeed? And obviously, Tamara, from a business perspective, are you already anticipating the changes this would mean for, uh, again, your day-to-day -day operations? So I will leave it to you to um, feel free to to jump in if you have a if you have an answer. Perhaps I would uh, I would pre I would prefer to give the floor to Anna just to comment on uh, whether Anna you believe in the success of this story. Well, thanks so much. Um, I uh, see that the question was about, uh, well, I addressed in my presentation DST and Pillar 1. The question is about Pillar 2, about minimal, uh, minimum uh, tax uh, worldwide, minimum tax rate. And a rumor has it that Pillar 2 is, uh, may, may happen. But I personally think that it has, but this is just my opinion, not the opinion of my employer. My, my, my idea is that Pillar 2 has more chances than Pillar 1. And well, I think that, well, we face now some changes, but either Pillar 1 is going to be extremely complex and we will face lots of administrative burden and lots of like extra payments. If Pillar 1 is not shooting, then we will have the variety of DSTs worldwide. And again, we will have as a taxpayers and as academics, as a consultants, as in-house tax uh, specialists will have amount, extra amount of work and extra amount of, of, um, uh, of, co of tax costs. So the question is about Pillar 2. My, my idea is that, that Pillar 2 may actually work, but about Pillar 1 and DST, I think, well, it, it would be great if it works, but I mean, this is, this is just, a huge amount of work. Where, where do you, thank you, where do you stand, Bernard? What do you think? Thank you. Um, I'm inclined to agree with Anna on, in terms of uh, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Uh, I think that the, um, the concept uh, of a minimal or rather minimum level of taxation for corporates is now out there. Uh, courtesy to some extent of the United States. This would have been unthinkable perhaps, I think, well, I think before the 2017 tax reform, uh, but now it's there. Um, and I agree that I don't think it's going away. Um, pillar one is more uh, problematic. It's more complex um, or it's likely to be more complex. Um, and it is facing more opposition uh, from the, again, from the United States in particular, among others. Um, and uh, I agree that if it's at least in the short term, uh, if pillar one doesn't happen in some form in, in reasonably near future, uh, jurisdictions, the EU and, and others, France and, and you know, various jurisdictions will move uh, towards DSTs. And the thing about taxes, of course, is that once, you know, there, some of them have explicit sunset provisions some of them, like the UK one, says, oh, we'll review it in, in 2025. But once these things come in, they tend not to go out, um, which I would, would think, uh, uh, again, Tamara in particular can speak this more, I would think that that's a very worrying prospect for, for the, the, the digital economy companies, including gaming companies. I'm not sure that in the longer term, uh, term if, I, if I can just add one thing, I'm not sure that the solution or a partial solution to these issues won't come from something else, like a different definition or an additional definition of PE, permanent establishment. So a digital permanent establishment or something like that, or Anna mentioned uh, the proposed Article 12B 
uh, to the UN model convention. So some definition or, or addition or expansion of the concept of royalties that would fit in uh, um, more easily to the existing framework. Because one of the issues I think uh, with pillar one is that it will create a whole new set of rules or it would create a whole new set of rules, probably a whole new enforcement mechanism enormous administrative and compliance burdens, not just for the uh, taxpayers and, and gaming companies and so on, but also for revenue administrations. Um, and some in particular will find, I think developing countries in particular will find those extremely hard to deal with. Um, so perhaps in the medium term, at least the more realistic, there, there are other things that could address at least some of the, uh, some of these aspects of taxation that are arguably, you know, more likely to be implemented. Thank you. Anna, what, what do you think um, the impact of that would be, what uh, Bernard suggested, rather than... an entire new system that is going to be more complex and, and burdensome um, to include or update a definition of, was it permanent establishment? Yeah, yes, digital PE or and digital PE. So slightly, slightly tweaking the existing principles to uh, to to react to the changing reality. Uh, would it be more feasible from your viewpoint? Well, we we here come to the question of administratability versus distorting uh, international tax law system, which was like somehow, but working. And we see that, for example, proposal 12B article is like on the withholding taxes of such payment on digitalized services. It, to my mind, it's very administratable, but uh, it has uh, pros and cons as well. So uh, it also, and um, well, there are, there were many things uh, including digital PE discussed um, I think, well, personally, I think that if I had an answer to that, I would be a, some professor somewhere, maybe very famous. Uh, and the thing is that, I mean, I also don't have an answer to that. And if there were a solution that we could shift one comma in uh, OECD model tax convention, or we could elaborate on some definition that would work and solve all the issues we have, that would possibly could have been found by some bright minds in academia, practice, OECD or UN. Um, I'm not aware of this possibility. And yeah, I agree that probably we'll have to review some, something significantly to try to solve this problem as, as the, the system was built up in the 1920s. It was long before video games and long before the computers. And well, long before the digitalization over worldwide. So yeah, we are just trying to put a very fancy head on some system that is not very well working. So we yeah, will see how, how the developments are going, but I agree to Bernard. I don't think there is like one comma solution to that. Um, thank you. Tamara, do you think that a possible, if not a solution, a uh, way to finding a solution uh, would be to have video game companies and obviously representatives of other types of digital economies at the table when this work is ongoing. Do you, from your own perspective, do you feel that uh, the industry and other types of digital industries are listened to um, or are being part of this dialogue looking for a solution that might not work for everyone, but might be the best possible solution that we can come up with. Uh, thank you, Michaela. Um, so I would be speaking here from, from my personal point of view, uh, also well, a little bit from what I see uh, in, my, in my practice. And uh, it's a very difficult question for, for me personally, because I work with a company which is not considered to be a large technological company. And as Anna mentioned before, uh, the current uh, initiatives, the OEC, at least at OECD and the UN level, 
they are primarily targeting uh, the large technological companies. So we're speaking about uh, such companies as Apple, Google, Microsoft, so really the giants. And I'm not sure what is going on at their level. Uh, perhaps the authorities are speaking to them. Perhaps they do uh, consult with them. Uh, but definitely at this stage, uh, they are not consulting with us. And I'm not sure if it's coming or not. Because for now, uh, we are discussing Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, uh, which mention video games. Uh, but so far, all the um, individual initiatives uh, in single countries uh, to impose, for example, digital service tax, um, except for the UK probably, and uh, Anna and Bernard, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think that anybody else considers uh, video games as the target for now of the GSP. Uh, so for these, for the beginning of, you know, of this story, we are somewhat outside of the scope uh, of, the, of the coming legislation. But my fear is that uh, we will be forgotten <laughs> if we are not included in the conversation from the very beginning. And uh, by saying we, I say that, um, I mean the, um, so to say, mid-level uh, video game uh, developers and publishers and also also small uh, companies that um, uh, that can possibly be, you know, put out of the game completely if uh, the uh, regulations that are enforced even at the global level and uh, if there is a unified solution that imposes a heavy administrative burden on those companies will make it impossible for them to comply, thus effectively kicking them out of the game. So um, I would say that it's very important and very desirable, of course, from our standpoint, that um, the organizations such as OECD um, consult with the, with the industries that they're trying to regulate. But I'm afraid that this can be my ideal world that I just live in. Well, fortunately, we are recording tonight, so we can send it to them. And uh, <laughs> let, I, let, um... let the voice of the industry be heard. Go ahead, Can I also add on that usually with this, all the proposals coming up by the OECD, uh, they also launch a public discussion. So anyone, uh, including everyone who is listening to us now, they can submit their proposal and they can submit their comments on the proposal. So um, they usually are quite tough on the timelines, but I believe that sometime this uh, first half of the year, 2021, they will open up for the public comments again. So everyone are more than welcome. I cannot, of course, know if, every, if they read everything, but I believe that the majority is read and heard. Not sure how it all can be implemented in one uh, one twenty pager uh, legislation, but well, let's see. Well, uh, another possible solution is to actually design a video game that is trying to build a perfect system for paying, collecting and administering taxes. I'm surprised no one has uh, came up with that idea yet. So that's another uh, project that uh, we can all work on together. And then you can use it with your international tax law students um, to, uh, to examine them, for example. Um, I think it has come... Uh, <laughs> I, think I like that come... idea. Yeah, you can. You <laughs> I can like have that it, idea Bernard. very much. More than happy for you to uh, to 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 use it and implement it on your course. Um, I just wanted to open uh, the floor to the audience. If anybody has any question, please uh, type it in, and um, I will pass it on to the speakers. If there's no question at the moment and sort of waiting perhaps for a question to come through. I have um, actually have one, um, another one. Um, I know that this is not uh, addressed in your article, Anna, but uh, apart from um, taxation being relevant in relation to the uh, value that users create through participation and interaction, um, there is also one element that does come up now and then, and that is users uh, acquiring income from um, playing, playing video games, and users being potentially targeted by uh, taxes within uh, the game. Now, from my understanding, this um, is a separate issue from international taxation, uh, but 
do you think that uh, these uh, may become taxes in the future? We will be taxed on um, money we earn from um, being in video games? Thank you so much, Michaela. I just love both questions. And I'm aware that there was some discussion in the US tax authorities and other tax authorities acquired uh, maybe a decade ago, or maybe uh, 10 to five years ago. And it has been so far uh, internationally reached that the, 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 the income you earn or the player earned within the video game is not taxed unless you uh, cash out this money. So while you're earning everything in your game, you're not obliged to pay anything as usually in the majority of the jurisdictions as far as I'm aware. And, um, and uh, when the, you cash out the money, when you sell something for the real money, then it is of course come as your personal income tax obligation. But I don't know if users actually do it because I think they just are not aware of that they have to do it. And the other issue we're talking about is the inside the game taxation, which we see in some multiplayer video games uh, where the user is taxed for a rental of the virtual apartment or maybe for sales of some virtual, uh, uh, virtual possessions. And I personally believe that it is very, I mean, I'm not sure to, if I'm allowed to use the terms good or bad, but I believe this is bad because this is actually a mechanism known to fight the in-game inflation because the, the amount of money users uh, earn there are unlimited while we have like limited capacity as the video games provider. And I always think about the, the user who is like in their like tax period and they have to file the declaration, they have to pay the, the tax payment and they, they are burdened with some, they are burdened with the, with the, the, the administrative stuff and they go and just don't wanna try and relax on some video games. And this user, she goes there and she thinks, oh, taxes again, why am I paying taxes here? So I think this is, maybe I'm a little bit in love with my job. I love taxes. And I think this is very harmful to, and it gives a negative connotation to taxation. But in fact, what we see inside the video games, these are not tax, these are not taxes, these are fees to fight in-game inflation. And I am I'm standing on this point. <laughs> Brilliant, amazing. Thank you for for having uh, such a clear uh, position on, on this on this issue. Um, Bernard, I actually wanted to ask, do you think that this this uh, is a sustainable view going forward, going back to the question whether income from engaging in a video game, uh, which is not cashed out, will not be taxed? I mean, because I don't, I don't think anybody really is cashing out anything these days and almost all our um, money and assets exist in a, in a digital way. And I can imagine that you earning uh, points or value in a game that you perhaps can then uh, translate to some other sort of benefits, either on the same platform or on a different platform. Um, so these tokens, virtual currency, whatever uh, represents the value that you may be uh, extracting from one environment can actually be used in another. Um, would that still uh, justify to, to argue that unless you, you cash it out and, and it exists, I expect as a real world currency, then it's not an income, which is not to suggest that I definitely want this income to be taxed, uh, but I'm just wondering, uh, looking into the future, whether this is a um, sustainable position? What do you think? It, it, it's, a, it's an excellent uh, question. I think it, it probably rests on a few uh, things. One is how much economic activity moves to the, the, the virtual world. Uh, simply, as you say, from a, the point of view of sustainability, the more that that's the case, um, the more that revenue authorities will be hard pressed or governments will be hard pressed to ignore, so to speak, the virtual, these virtual economies, simply because of the numbers involved. I mean, the numbers are already massive uh, and they're uh, presumably just going to get bigger and bigger. Um, certainly if you, if you, uh, uh, you know, look at the, the science fiction type movies, you know, Ready Player One and all these things, I mean, we're heading towards a world of immersive virtual reality and so on. 
Um, that having been said, it is difficult to, to think about, a ver I think, uh, you know, sort of my initial thoughts on this topic is that it's difficult to think about uh, treating a virtual uh, currency or benefit within a single game um, as anything other than an in-game thing. So, because unless... Uh, with one major exception, which I'll suggest, which may or may not uh, uh, find favor with people. Once it becomes something that can move from platform to platform, then, and, and it has an existence outside one particular virtual environment, um, then I think you, you, have, you have a transaction that, you know, or a transfer that is more amenable to taxation. Um, so if, for example, a bunch of games uh, adopted one virtual currency and you could move it between the games, I don't know, Tamara will probably tell me that's completely unrealistic, it'll never happen or they'll never agree to it, but hypothetically. The other thing, though, that I wonder, um, and I've not really thought about it very deeply, I have to say, is whether revenue authorities will decide that they will use the game companies as their proxies. So the tax so this income, so to speak, in the virtual reality will then have to be translated by the game platform or the game company into real dollars, euros, pounds, Bitcoin, whatever, that is then paid to the revenue authorities according to some formula. And then that, of course, gets you back to this question of, of you know, how you value, right? All these things that are not really finalized in, in, in pillar one or in general. Um, but but that would be consistent, uh, arguably, with a general trend that we see in collection, which is that revenue authorities are pushing these things onto the marketplace, right? So we started off with employers withholding income tax on employees and transferring it to the revenue authority. Maybe at some point we will see a similar kind of thing with virtual companies collecting effectively on behalf of revenue authorities. Super, thank you. And I will give Tamara a chance to uh, to respond to that as a sort of last contribution because uh, it is six o'clock and uh, we are at the end of our talk. And um, Tamara, do you anticipate something like that from a business perspective? Do you think um, this is um, a realistic model proposition? Thank you, Michaela. Can I just say two words? I, I think uh, this will conclude my argument. Bad idea. <laughs> Very bad idea. <laughs> we do not support it. Uh, but um, yeah, just a little bit uh, to explain myself, uh, Bernard has raised a very interesting uh, and controversial uh, point for discussion. What is the Indian currency and whether the Indian currency can be considered um, as an equivalent to the uh, traditional currency? Uh, and then if the, if the answer to this question is yes, then apparently all the income that you receive in the game by playing the game, by exchanging some items uh, or selling them within the game, should be taxed. Um, so this is a, an ongoing discussion currently in multiple jurisdictions. We see, for example, the laws uh, in the Russian Federation, again, because it's the most interesting jurisdiction, to be honest, uh, in terms of new, uh, new laws. Uh, so they have adopted recently a new law on the uh, virtual currencies, how, that's how they call them. And uh, it's really, to be honest, it's really unclear what they're talking about, but the regulation uh, provides for a special regime for such um, virtual currencies, uh, bringing them as close to the real currencies as possible. So for now, we think that this uh, law applies uh, mostly to the cryptocurrencies, uh, but again, uh, it depends on the enforcement practices and uh, who knows, you know, in which direction it goes and where we will be in 2022. Um, but I hope that we will not be in the situation where the Indian currencies are equal to real, uh, to the traditional world currencies, because it's going to make our life even more complicated. Well, I think we we have at least two, if not three, topics for follow up um, seminars on video games and taxes. Right. I wanted to 
thank you all for coming tonight for your amazing contributions and a completely um, fabulous talk on uh, so two at the first side different areas and yet uh, such a big overlap such a big synergy between uh, these two fields and I do hope that this is first of of many uh, discussions and, and conversations that we will have uh, with a wider and wider audience. Thank you, Anna, Tamara, Bernard, and everybody else in the audience for being here tonight. Um, and um, I wish you a uh, good night. The event was recorded and we will be posting the link on our website so you can share it uh, further and rewatch it as many times as you want just in case you've missed something. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michaela, and also to the IELR, and of course to Anna and, and Tamara for uh, hosting and participating respectively. Thank you. <laughs>